a full-sized engine in motion, an empty cab, and a very specialized controller. Today, we're talking about remote control locomotives. Plus, we'll look at some of the technology that helps railroads run monster freight trains. That's all coming up next. You know, as a kid, you may have had an RC car, boat, or helicopter. Yeah, I'm guilty of crashing a few of those, but the machines we're discussing in this video, well, they are not toys. Locomotives rolling down the tracks with no one in the cab. That may turn a few heads, but it's fairly common if you're around a rail yard. The person in charge of this train is actually operating it with a special control unit. Now, in case you're wondering, that odd-looking machine with no cab is called a slug. It doesn't have an engine and its traction motors are powered by the mother unit it's connected to. Right now, the slug and the other two locomotives are being remotely controlled. You can see the operator moving the lash up and eventually coupling onto some cars and shoving them around Norfolk Southern's Inman Yard in Atlanta, Georgia. Signs like these help the general public understand what's going on in yards that use RCLs or remote control locomotives. RCLs have been used by U.S. Class 1 railroads since the start of 2002, according to the FRA. But before that, they could be found on railroads in other countries and in industrial operations and mines. According to the FRA, some U.S. regional and short-line railroads also experimented with RCL operations in the 1990s. Some of the spotting features on these units include orange flashing lights, decals telling folks that the unit is remote controlled, and special antennas on the roof. Now, just a side note here. Many of the antennas on this cab are for PTC or positive train control. So how does all this work? Well, I'm gonna give you a very general overview based on my research and observations. First, let's check this out. This photo, courtesy of Canada's Transportation Safety Board, shows us what an OCU or Operator Control Unit looks like. Of course, an OCU like this one is used to give commands to the locomotive. You can see an operator using his to couple up to some cars at Norfolk Southern's Industry Yard in East Point, Georgia. Here's another look at an Operator Control Unit. This diagram comes from a patent assigned to Catron North America Incorporated. These OCUs have different speed settings like couple, coast, and stop. The equipment on the locomotive will use the throttle and brakes to achieve those speeds. Now, there are brake override controls here on the left. Here's another patent diagram of the locomotive control unit, or LCU, that's located on the locomotive itself. RCLs and the systems that control them can do things like sound the bell as the engine begins to move. And there's also another degree of automation that assists in RCL operations. It's called remote control pullback protection, and you might hear this on one of the frequencies used by railroads that have implemented remote operations. The FRA defines remote control pullback protection as a system that uses automated equipment identifier tags to either stop the RCL or limit its speed so that the RCL remains within its work zone. Now, the RCO, or remote control operator, who's wearing that OCU is often a one-man band. There's no locomotive engineer. That was the case here at Norfolk Southern's Norris Yard in Irondale, Alabama. Typically, train crews consist of an engineer and conductor, and train movements when switching are coordinated using radios or hand signals. Switchmen may also be present to help out. With no one in the cab, the OCUs these operators use have to have safety features built in in case something goes wrong. For example, if the operator somehow falls over and the operator control unit is tilted more than 45 degrees, it applies the train's emergency brakes. The brakes are also applied if the OCU loses its connection to the locomotive. Remote control systems like these are certainly interesting, but they have stirred up some controversy. Taking a crew member, in this case the engineer, out of the equation means one less job on the railroad. 
It could also be argued that an engineer in the cab has more of a feel for the train and its controls. So far, we've looked at trains that work at low speeds, but radio waves are also used to control locomotives and freight trains that travel faster than what you'd see a yard job doing. These days, trains are long, and it seems like they're just getting longer. To help move these things down the line, railroads commonly use engines known as DPUs, or distributed power units. They'll put these in the middle of a train or at the back. Now, the lash-ups you see at the front of the train are controlled using multiple unit cables. Standardized MU cables that connect to plugs like this transmit the engineer's commands to each unit. The hoses on either side of the coupler are for the brakes on the units that are coupled together. The hose in the middle here is for the train line and controls the brakes on all the cars that make up the train. Now, it's not impossible to have wiring reach the units in the middle or at the end of the train, but the solution that's used most often is radio control. A popular system on Class 1 railroads is called Locotrol and is made by Wobtech. These days, this is often built into a new locomotive. But the concept of using unmanned, radio-controlled locomotives is not a new idea. In the 1960s, companies like the Southern Railway began using specialized cars to house the radio control equipment. One of those specialized cars used by the Southern Railway is actually hiding in some of these aerial pictures of Inman Yard that most likely date back to the mid-1970s. Few observant viewers may also notice that the Southern Railway was using slugs back then, too. Of course, radio control technology is now small enough to fit inside a locomotive. These modern DP units use a radio link to the head-end locomotive to receive throttle and braking commands. By distributing the motive power in the middle or on the end of a train, the forces on the draft gears and couplers are reduced. Just think about all the forces those draft gears and couplers are subjected to on a heavy train. Adding a mid-train DPU to help push and pull can help reduce those forces and also enables railroads to run longer trains. It can also help to maintain air pressure throughout the train. Now that's a very simplified explanation, but hopefully it gets the point across. I found this topic really interesting, and I hope you did too. To try to understand how all this stuff works, I went through patents, manuals, marketing materials, and other publications, but I don't actually have any hands-on experience with remote control locomotives or DPUs. If you do, or if you have any other interesting information to share, leave a comment below. And as always, Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.